In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Up a desert mountain, brilliant blue skies, no haze, no humidity, visibility for miles, sun squinting brilliance, four men in their prime, good friends, sharing travels, sharing meals, sharing one unifying purpose, pause. In that pause, they encounter mystery. The one they follow is transfigured, transformed. His clothes become dazzling white. One account records that his face shone like the sun. Two great prophets of their faith, long dead, materialize out of the ether and speak quietly to the leader. A cloud from a cloudless sky suddenly appears, obscuring the scene. A voice breaks through, this is my son, my chosen Listen, absorb, focus on him. And it's done. All effects disappear. No cloud, no prophets, no shining face, no dazzling clothes, no commanding voice, nothing to be mentioned. Down the mountain they come. The chosen and his dearest companions, Peter and James and John, they join the other disciples and strike out on the road to Jerusalem where dangers of the empire and the enemies of our Lord lie in wait. Although they have been told more than once, Peter and James and John don't get what lies ahead. If they are terrified by a cloud on the mountain, imagine their fear when armed centurions, bound hands, a thorny crown, nails and crosses and a shuttered room greet them. And while Jesus knows that his mission calls for his death, until it happens, there is hope for another outcome. So, this mountaintop experience at this time occurs for a purposeful reason. It will be recalled and savored in the days to come, in the troubling hours, in the swirling of their minds. They will remember the figures of their patriarchs and the voice of God assuring them of his power and his devotion to them and the universal consequence he has called them to do. The recollection will be encouraging and will help them endure until hope is made manifest. The church appoints this gospel passage for the last Sunday of Epiphany. It is the last lesson we will hear before taking up the readings of Lent. It is meant to be a gift for us as it was for the four men on the mountain that day. It is meant to encourage us as we face the suffering and the loneliness on the way to the cross. It is meant to help us hold on 
to double down on our faith until we encounter the risen Lord at Easter. It is a gracious gesture, and I appreciate the thought, but to be honest, it's not working for me this time around. I hope that's not true for you, but I suspect it could be. This last Sunday of Epiphany, looking at Ash Wednesday with its invitation to observe of Holy Lent just three days away, finds me irritable and unsettled. We will soon hear Pharisees plot to kill our Lord. A trusted friend will sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. One of his closest friends will swear he has no knowledge of him. Others will not pray with him when he is scared. And crowds of former supporters will cry out, crucify him. And we hear this. And we carry this while suffering for the third straight Lent under a global pandemic that has claimed 5.8 million lives. So many souls released. So much time with them lost. So much time in various forms of isolation. We don't know the full effects of that yet, but we do know it doesn't do the human psyche good. Three Lents under a pandemic. Three Lents in heightened civil divisiveness at home and abroad. Maybe not the farmers or the preschool teachers, but the Russian leaders are on my list. I'm incensed that they are meddling in our elections. I am disgusted they are bullying teenage girls who just want to skate. I am so sick, so sick that they are bombing a peaceful neighbor, killing non-combatants, posing no threat, all for the purpose of stealing a natural resource to assuage their greed. My ire isn't reserved for foreign powers only. If I get another mailing from my political party of choice claiming that the opposing party has no soul or morals or concern for our citizens, rather than committing to the hard work of compromise and seeking common ground for common good, I suspect I'll cry on my way to the trash can. In the land of the free and the home of the brave, can we possibly have three consecutive months without a racially challenged killing? Can we find the resolve to do better, to be better? Can that not be a rhetorical question? And then there's also the ambient dread of un ongoing unknowing. When will things go back to normal? If that normal is never coming back, what will the nor new normal look like? And how can I prepare for it or defend against it? It's all so wearying even Uber copers are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Beloved, here is true, here is what is true for me at this time. I love the God I know. I trust the God I know. And I am lamenting. I am lamenting these times. I long for better. 
for peace, for stability, for more broadly expressed kindness. I hope these things are on the horizon. I'm committed to praying for and working for them, and yet answers elude me. So, as we move from Epiphany to Lent, from the season of light to the season of repentance, I need something more, or if not more, something different to bolster my intent. Giving up ice cream isn't going to be a sufficient Lenten practice for me this year. I'm pretty convinced I'm going to need all the flavors to keep me on even keel. What I think will be helpful is thoughtful pre-work. Thoughtful pre-work. I think making a Lenten plan for these times is in order. I believe over the coming 40 days, time in sincere lament, naming before God the sadness of my heart for the human condition and our waywardness and our dependence on God's saving help will be beneficial. I think narrowing the scope of my longing thinking about specific places I can be a light in the world and those places I should put down as worries for others to shoulder will be worthwhile. I think increased attention to signs of hope is critical. Noticing those signs in my own life and encouraging others to express the places they find hope is not a sentimental or superficial experience. Touching hope, touching hope engenders well-being and reminds us God is present in the all in all, holding us and healing us and bringing us to wholeness. It may be that the traditional practices of keeping a holy Lent are exactly what your soul cries out for this year. They have had efficacies for centuries. Or presence in worship the next six weeks up to Easter, or a conversation with your clergy about the lament or longing of your soul, or unvarnished coffee sharing with a church friend or a walk in the park for a local food charity like the one happening Sunday afternoon or St. Margaret's Saturday retreat on the 26th where you look for signs of God in the midst of these troubled times. Maybe, maybe these are where God is calling you to meet him. You you and God know best what balm your soul needs. What is true for these times is that they are not dissimilar to the dark darkness that surrounded Jesus as he walked off that mountain onto the road, taking him to his death. There is sadness and heaviness to be dealt with, and there is promised hope to be embraced. And as we've discovered through the long months of disease and discord, we cannot cry our lament, we cannot satisfy our longing, we cannot manifest our hope by our own will alone. We need transfiguration. We need transformation. We need God. This Lent especially, do not be caught unprepared. Think about what you need 
for the journey from where you are to where you need to be the day of the resurrection. Make your answer and let your church help make it so. Whether it's a mountaintop experience or a slow unfolding, it will be gift to your soul. Beloved, God wants to hold our lament and answer our hope. We too are his chosen. <laughs>